I'd like to thank the program committee for having the um, wit to put masochism uh, as an early lecture on a Sunday morning to demonstrate that if you really want to understand the subject, it has to hurt a little. So I'm going to be talking about uh, one of the orphans of the DSM process, um, uh, self-defeating personality disorder, what's usually been known as masochistic character. And this is work that I've done with two colleagues, one of whom presented a poster yesterday, uh, Dr. Vera Bekesh. A little background. So first, the precursors of masochistic character, which was sexual masochism. Um, its literary roots uh, go to a professor, Professor Leopold von sacher Massach, who was a professor at Lviv uh, uni uh, University in, I think, what was Ukraine, who uh, wrote a famous book, which was a bestseller after, uh, first it was banned, and then it was a bestseller, called Venus in Furs. Um, on December 19, 1868, Sacher Masak and his mistress, Fanny Pistor, signed a contract making him her slave for a period of six months with the stipulation that she wear furs as often as possible, especially when she was in a cruel mood. So that's the origins. But medically, this was picked up by Dr. Richard Freiherr von Kraft Ebbing, who wrote Psychopathia Sexualis. And he wrote, uh, during recent years, facts have been advanced that prove that Sacher Masak was not only the poet of masochism, but he, that he himself was afflicted with the anomaly. Although these proofs were communicated to me without restriction, I refrain from giving them to the public. I believe that's a HIPAA warning, uh, Kirka 150 years ago. But the uh, roots as uh, masochism as a character type um, were, uh, of course, uh, begun with Sigmund Freud's 1924 publication, The Economic Problem of Masochism, which is a great title because it outlines something that's still true to this day. You can't make any money off this topic as a researcher. Okay, but anyway, um, he pointed out there was a clear differentiation of character from the sexual phenomenon of masochism. So uh, for today's as background for today's presentation, um, Dr. Beckish and I and Dr. Robertson uh, found 24 authors in the psychoanalytic literature um, who focused on masochistic character, presented case material, and a theoretical attempt to understand their dynamics. Sometimes they were quite clear, such as Wilhelm Reich, who was a very clear author. Sometimes they were impenetrable. Um, and using difficult terminology. Sometimes they were just long. <laughs> okay. But um, this comes together with the, uh, that um, bright spot in the DSM history of DSM 3R, where there was a proliferation of different types, and uh, several types, such as self defeating, were put in the appendix for further study. Um, Apparently, the, the, the following DSMs tried to do an appendectomy, so we don't really have it anymore, but it still exists in that uh, appendix. So, why am I interested in this topic? It's primarily because of the patients. So, in clinical practice, there's clearly a group of patients who, across many DSM-4 types, including um, PDNOS, that bring about their own failures, cling to suffering, gravitate to dominant, controlling individuals, and fail to do what's in their own best interest, and they're difficult to treat. Phenomena which have been also written about in the therapeutic literature, such as uh, include negative therapeutic reactions to getting better, that is, the patient who has a success and then orchestrates a failure. Um, func they're functional, but often chronic, and they improve slowly, or some people would say they don't at all. In short, the character traits are really not adequately studied. They're not captured in DSM-4 or it's um, uh, recently, uh, uh, I, well, DSM-5 is now in the appendix of DSM-5. Um, but um, there are no systematic attention to uh, the group in the therapy literature. And you know, we don't have a, a, a manual for masochistic-focused uh, therapy. So our systematic... Um, uh, literature review um, was quantitative. We identified 
the authors and then broke down uh, their articles into what we think of as thematic units. Each thematic unit was usually about a paragraph in length where the author really tried to put something concise together to explain what was going on dynamically with a patient or with the group of patients. The average uh, author had about 13 thematic units. Again, some of the paragraphs were short, and then Otto Kernberg wrote some. <laughs> so you, w what we did next was we used a standardized rating system that we actually use on patients to actually rate the material as if it were patient verbatim. And, um, so we have a list of 30 defenses that we tried to identify, 40 wishes and 40 fears. It's a system of motives that divide uh, motives into an Ericksonian developmental hierarchy as to the, the time frame and development when a motive is salient. And then 14 specific dynamic conflicts. Um, so we then rated these things and developed a dynamic profile of the masochistic character, treating again each unit as if it were a patient. And that data was presented uh, yesterday at a poster. So today's presentation has several aims. Um, uh, we're going to use an existing patient samples to examine descriptive and dynamic aims. The descriptive aims are, first of all, um, a self-defeating personality disorder. Is it a uni or a multidimensional construct? What's its prevalence in these patient populations? And what's its relationship to other PD types? The dynamic aims, uh, originally I was gonna try to look at conflicts, defenses, and motives, but frankly, it's just too much, so I'm gonna stick with the conflicts. So we have two samples that I've combined for some of the analyses and are separated for others. The first is uh, the Austin Riggs follow-along study, um, where over a nine-year period, um, ad uh, adult patients uh, who were admitted uh, for residential care uh, signed up for the study. Uh, they were referred to the Austin Riggs Center for treatment refractory disorders, so they were often uh, sicker than in many, uh, even tertiary care uh, facilities. Their mean treatment length at the, inst uh, at the institution was about an average of two-thirds of a year. And then most of them went on to further treatment in the community, and we continued to follow them. Uh, the second is a, a study at my hospital department. Sorry for the Marco Rubio moment. Um, the Institute of Community and Family Psychiatry Long-Term Dynamic Psychotherapy Study, which we abbreviate as ICFP. These were adult outpatients, also considered refractory to previous short-term treatments, who were referred for up to two and a half to three years of uh, dynamic outpatient psychotherapy. Their referring diagnoses were uh, across a wide spectrum of mood, anxiety, or personality disorders. And their mean treatment length was three years. So the reason I can combine these two samples is that I was the PI on both, and I used exactly the same methods and designs in both naturalistic observational studies. Um, so people would be admitted, given informed consent, um, then they had a guided clinical interview, which takes around three hours or longer, um, which takes a thorough personal and clinical history, um, getting stories from the patient about uh, various aspects throughout their life. Um, there is, it's not really a question-answer type um, interview. It more, uh, flows more the way a clinical session does. Um, the, after the interview is over, the axes are then scored on scoring forms, and I included, uh, at the beginning of the study, the DSM-4 types plus all four that were in the appendices, either of 3R and 4, on the principle that it said we needed to do future studies, further study on these, so I said, why not? Um, now, the fact that I'm uh, stuck with uh, studying orphan disorders is uh, interesting, because passive-aggressive, who's the last time... When's the last time anybody made that diagnosis, okay? Well, if you're a department chairman, you make it very often, but it's usually not about patients. So anyway, these things uh, do exist. They just, um, they sometimes fall out of favor. Anyway, after the diagnosis, we would then uh, give a dynamic interview, which was usually about an hour in length uh, and videotaped or audio taped. And then a relationship anecdote paradigm interview in which we would ask people to tell stories 
uh, about interactions they had with people uh, in their uh, personal life at work and uh, also any past uh, therapy experiences. So these two data sources were then transcribed. We had tapes of them and, and listening to them and or watching the tapes and reading the transcript was the source of the dynamic material for the ratings uh, for the conflicts. Um, in addition, in both studies, um, people were then followed and these methods were repeated at intervals and in the RIG study it, uh, it was up to uh, um, about 14 years of follow-up. Now you'll be forgiven if you don't remember that there is such a thing as self-defeating personality and certainly what the criteria are. Um, I'll, uh, I'll sort of summarize them, there are eight. And uh, DSM-3R required uh, five of, of the following. One, chooses people in situations that lead to disappointment, failure, or mistreatment, even when better options are available. Two, rejects or renders ineffective the attempts of others to help him or her. Three, following positive personal events, re responds with depression, guilt, or behavior that produces pain. Four, incites angry or rejecting responses from others and then feels hurt, defeated, or humiliated. Five, rejects opportunities for pleasure or is reluctant to acknowledge enjoying him or herself. Six, fails to accomplish tasks crucial to his or her personal objectives despite demonstrated ability. Seven, is uninterested in or rejects people who consistently treat him or her well. And eight, engages in excessive self-sacrifice that is unsolicited. Um, conflicts uh, were assessed using a quantitative method called the um, psychodynamic conflict, uh, rating, dynamic conflict rating scales, which is a, uh, a list of 14 dynamic conflicts uh, roughly divided into seven that are considered focal in the sense that they, they are limited to certain aspects of personality functioning and others which are called global, which are uh, largely synonymous with um, the term pre-edipal meaning that uh, they, the origins of these conflicts are uh, early in development and um, occur in a wide range of uh, situations uh, for the patient. Um, so uh, the reliability, the average reliability was an intra-class R, inter-rater reliability of 0.72. And I'm not gonna describe defenses and motives since I won't be uh, actually talking about them. So some of the measurement characteristics. Uh, this is just the usual uh, de rigueur slide on uh, reliability of diagnosis and of the uh, scales. And um, of the method, uh, the average uh, personality disorder type had a weighted cap of 0.79, and uh, self-defeating was slightly below that as a type. Um, as a continuous scale, it was sort of uh, uh, not bad, 0.79 intraclass R, whereas the all, all scales together was uh, median of 0.92. When we look at the internal homogeneity or consistency, uh, Kronbach's alpha, I, it was sort of near the median, which was, uh, the median was 0.74 for all of the different PD types, um, and um, the um, uh, one for self-defeating was 0 0.70. And uh, the other three I have there, are ones that relate to self-defeating. That's why I decided to show those. Now this next slide, um, the next two slides look at uh, the, the question of is there a, a single structure or uh, are there dimensions within this personality disorder type? And um, <clears throat> um, when, you, when doing the factor analysis, uh, there was a very big jump from the first factor down to the next two. So in a situation like that, um, one can consider, well, maybe there's only one thing going on. So this is you know, how all of the features relate to one another um, if you consider it as a single unitary factor and explains 33% of the variance. If you extract all three factors, um, uh, there are three, apparently three sub-dimensions. The first is an object-oriented form of self-defeating uh, behavior. Uh, with criteria one, seven, and eight, choosing disappointing people or situation, rejecting caring people, and engaging in self-sacrifice unsolicited by the recipient. The second one is more of a self-sabotage uh, form of uh, uh, self-defeating personality, 
uh, with criteria four, two, and six, incites angry, rejecting responses, rejects help or renders help ineffective, and fails to accomplish personal objectives. And then the final uh, two criteria, three and five, are a general inhibition and guilt um, f uh, dimension. Uh, following success responds with guilt, uh, depression, et cetera, or rejects opportunities for pleasure. And uh, all told, uh, these three factors accounted for 60, uh, almost 62% of the variance, which is, is pretty good. Oh, the end for this is around 250. So this looks at the prevalence. How often uh, do, we, do we actually find the, these people? So um, here I've uh, put the two samples side by side because, again, the rig sample is slightly uh, more ill. Um, so 82% of the rig sample had a personality disorder, which is not surprising because many people are sent there for that, along with uh, chronic uh, um, refractory depression and, and suicidality. And uh, the ICFP sample, 75% had a PD. The mean number, if you have a PD at all, the mean number of types was uh, 1.6. Now, for those of you who've you know, looked at all kinds of samples, you say, gee, that's pretty low. And uh, I would point out that the guided clinical interview does not uh, have a, um, it has, it has good predictive um, uh, characteristics. Many of the ways we make diagnoses tend to overrate certain things. Like for instance, you can see samples where people have 10% with paranoid personality. If anyone's ever treated someone with paranoid personality, you understand that um, most structured interviews overdiagnose this. So the guided clinical interview actually does not, thanks. Um, have um, uh, a large, uh, 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 make too many diagnoses. So borderline, of course, is the most prevalent, uh, followed by depressive, then self-defeating, then PD-NOS, then dependent. Now, uh, except for borderline, uh, the rest of those most prevalent diagnoses were either uh, extinguished or slated for extinction, um, but they're the most prevalent things that we see. So um, this looks at the overlap, uh, specifically if you have uh, a diagnosis. So on, on the uh, left-hand um, column, we see that uh, of those who are borderline, 34% also had self-defeating. Of those with dependent, 31% had self-defeating, and depressive, 36%. If we look at the other way, of all the people who met the criteria for self-defeating, we see that 64% met the criteria for borderline. But in the outpatient sample, where we actually had a higher proportion of self-defeating, that number was a bit lower, it was only 46%. And then um, uh, the proportion with other disorders was a bit lower for dependent and depressive. So again, uh, self-defeating is most likely to be comorbid with borderline depressive and dependent. So if you do a factor analysis of all of the different um, scores of the uh, personality disorders, we get something that looks fairly similar to other uh, people's analyses. Um, the first factor is a, a narcissistic factor, which includes antisocial personality. Um, the second is a depressive borderline self-defeating factor. The third, uh, schizotypal schizoid paranoid, and the fourth, obsessive compulsive. So this is more or less what you would get in other analyses too, except they usually didn't include self-defeating. But you can see that it sort of uh, fits in in the middle of the depressive uh, borderline factor. Um, this shows that people with self-defeating are a little bit more ill than uh, other uh, patients who don't have it, i.e. in terms of AXIS-1 and current AXIS-1 disorders. Uh, axis three disorders and a lower best GAF in the past year. So dynamically, um, we have three uh, conflicts that we're going to look at. Um, I won't read read these to you, unfortunately, time-wise. Uh, we can go back to it if you have questions. So the first is the uh, global conflict over the experience and expression of emotional needs. This is a, a very uh, generic conflict uh, originally designed to, to capture a lot of the inhibition that people with personality disorders have. And the literature noted it in 32% of the, the thematic units. Overall gratification inhibition, uh, which was described by Arietti and Bemporad, 
um, uh, which uh, people feel they don't have a right to a life of their own, was found in 30% of the thematic units, and dominant other conflict, also described by Ariadne and Bemparad, in which individuals require nurturing and supportive relationship with a dominant individual and are very sensitive to disturbances in that relationship. That was found in 25% of the literature. So this looks at the relationship between these conflicts and self-defeating personality. And we see that, in fact, the three <clears throat> prominent um, conflicts, in fact, do correlate both in the bivariate analyses with the three, uh, with self-defeating. And when we partial out the co-occurring disorders, that is borderline dependent and depressive, we see that this remains the case or is strengthened. So there's a suppressive effect of these comorbid disorders on the relationship in, in at least one instance. Um, plus, there's some other uh, unanticipated um, findings. We had three minor hypotheses, uh, none of which showed up. Um, and again, uh, they were low prevalence in the literature, so uh, they didn't show up in the actual data either. If we look at the three forms of self-defeating, we do see some differentiation. Um, that uh, in the self-defeating uh, object orientation dimension, we see the dominant other and the overall gratification inhibition. In the self-sabotage one, we see a lot of conflicts with achievement and self-esteem as well as overall gratification inhibition. And in the uh, more severe form, the guilt and inhibition form, uh, in addition to some dominant other and overall gratification, we see the global conflict, that, that highly uh, prevalent one in personality disorders. So these patients would be sicker. They also had fear of fusion, which is a wish to merge with a perfect object, but a fear of being uh, sort of psychologically taken over by that person. So um, we also did some follow-up. And uh, I should say, first of all, that um, self-defeating patients are dynamically more ill than people without it. And, uh, and also, when you partial out the other things including borderline, that's, that uh, degree of uh, relationship to illness, dynamic illness, uh, strengthens somewhat. So this looks at uh, up to 13 years of follow-up um, for 54 patients who had repetitive um, uh, uh, dynamic uh, assessments every two years. And um, there are two lines here, uh, regression lines, showing the rate at which they are losing their uh, uh, to conflict pathology. And uh, the self-defeating people are slightly more uh, ill, um, but the rates of, of change are about the same between the two groups, and they, in fact, converge around 13 years. And um, it, the line there at 0 0.10, that's where dynamic health, or dynamic recovery, I should say, uh, occurs, and <clears throat> you can see the time frame <clears throat> for about half the sample to get better looks to be about 13 to 14 years. So, in conclusion, um, DSM has made an orphan out of self-defeating personality, but I would say we ignore it at the peril of failing to help clinicians with this group of patients. So the construct itself can be viewed either as a unitary or as a uh, three-dimensional construct in which there's an object-oriented form of self-defeating, a self-sabotaging form, and a guilt and inhibition form. It's reliably identifiable. It has a high prevalence in treatment-resistant resi samples, um, and it was uh, it, uh, uh, is, uh, borderline is more prevalent, but it's... Uh, it's pretty close up there to one-sixth to one-quarter of the patients met those criteria. Um, and it co-occurs with depressive, borderline, and dependent personality disorders. Dynamically, it's related to three conflicts. The most generic one that went through all three subtypes uh, or dimensions was overall gratification inhibition, um, which is also considered the um, conflict of chronic depression by uh, Ariad and Bempo Rad. Uh, then there's the global conflict over experiencing and expressing emotional needs and anger, where the person feels they don't uh, want to be aware of their own mental life and don't have a right to express anything. And then there's the more limited uh, dominant other form. 
So these patients are somewhat more ill than non-self-defeating patients, but the good news is they do improve over years uh, with a median time uh, to dynamic recovery estimated to be 14 years. All right, these are, all studies have collaborators and I'd like to thank these individuals who uh, were part of this study. Thank you.